Coming up now is a really great interview with director Jonas Ockerlund. Now, this is actually just an audio podcast, but don't let that put you off. Jonas is an amazing director. He's a director of videos. Madonna, Ray of Light, amongst many others. Lady Gaga and Beyonce Telephone. He's worked often with uh, Lady Gaga. He made his name through um, experimental films, followed by commercials. But he's also directed movies and series. Sit back and listen to this because you'll really find out what sort of work ethic is needed to be successful. And he talks at length about Madonna's work ethic and, of course, about Lady Gaga's creativity. It's very special, but as I said, it's audio only, so be prepared. Here's Jonas Ockerland. So, Jonas, we met um, a few years ago for the first time at the Groucho Club in London when we had a meeting. And one thing that really impressed me about you was this warmth and kindness and the ability to listen and the ability to communicate, which is which are things that have stood you in good stead throughout your um, <laughs> professional life, I'm sure. Um, you're obviously known as someone who's deep into pop culture, but I'm just wondering... As a child growing up in Sweden, what sort of family did you have when you were a young child and what was your introduction to popular culture? Did you have any at that point? Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, thanks for the kind words, uh, for starters. <laughs> and um, well, I kind of grew up like middle class, you know, divorced parents, my mom, uh, went into some uh, sort of party uh, party years when she when 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 my my parents split up and I was surrounded by music always and I had a sister who was uh, a couple of years older who basically introduced me to uh, especially English music like a lot of music so I was always surrounded by music. Um, and back then, Sweden, Swedish television and it was basically nothing. We, it was public television and nothing really interesting. So filmmaking was never in my head back then. It was always all about the music. And I thought for years that I was going to be a musician and I was going to spend my life uh, somehow working in the, in the music world. When did you get a drum kit? Uh, kind of late for... You know, again, it wasn't like I started thinking that I was going to be a drummer. It was, it was, it was basically like, okay, that guy has a guitar, that guy could sing, and you know, that guy could, you know, play drums. And I became the drummer. And uh, I would say maybe I was twelve years old, thirteen years old when I got my first drum kit. You know, practicing in a basement. Every, every I, we lived in houses, and every house basically had instruments in the basement. So it was a lot of music. Wherever you went, like, you know, we formed new bands like every week, basically. So you you didn't really disturb your mother by playing the drums or she wasn't irritated by you wanting a drum kit or anything at that point? Well, moms, moms in general from that era was very, had a lot of patience and they, they no, they, it was actually fine. And uh, like I said, my mom had like a lot of parties back then. So a lot of her friends came down playing as well. So, yeah, and, you know, and also there was one thing I'm not sure why, but Sweden was very attractive for uh, all the touring bands. So a little later, we started to go and see shows. And the shows was like everybody just came through Sweden for some reason, even though back then Sweden was a pretty small market, like all the major bands always came through Sweden. So the reason, and we they, went, did, the it, reason they did is that it was... Um, Often it was Sweden or it would, uh, tours would start in Helsinki or they'd start in Stockholm. And the reason those big tours started there was because it was the first night. It was almost like a test night in a small yeah. market. And the second yeah. night is when they would be filmed. Um, so I think that's interesting. You're also an MTV generation person. And I'm wondering when you saw your first video or the first visual image that really impressed you and made an impact on you when was that and what was it um uh well i mean again swedish television was very behind we were like the last country in the world to get commercial tv stations 
So for us, it was like a lot of tapes rolling around and the Swedish uh, public television always said, you got to help me, Steve. There was this uh, German show that came out on uh, with live bands playing that was like once a year or something like that, uh, that had like a lot of impact, like a lot of bands playing. I would say this is probably early 80s. Um, so, but then of course, ABBA did like a lot of visual stuff that we knew about. Uh, that, but, you know, the idea of filming musicians and turn them into music videos came way later. Uh, I didn't really think about that until way later. Um, and of course, as you know, American MTV came first. So before we even had European music videos, I traveled a lot in America and we started to check into the motels that actually had MTV so we can watch music videos. That's brilliant. You were, you were in a band yourself. Um, when you were young, you said you were in bad, different bands every week, but you were also in a, in a death metal band uh, in an early age. Yeah. What, what, what attracted you to that music and what tr attracted you to uh, that type of genre? Well, we were, we were into rock and roll for sure, uh, starting early with 70s bands. Uh, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I, I basically started in the Alice Cooper, the Sweet, Slade, you know, all the glam world. And then obviously Kiss came into my life and uh, a lot of English stuff like Thin Lizzy and Status Quo, like all those things were on my radar. But the one that always were my favorite band and still up to this day was always Black Sabbath. And when we started to play metal, uh, the eighties uh, kind of like glam scene was very big. And me and my friends, we were not really into that kind of, uh, you know, Sunset Strip type of metal. Uh, we were drawn to like the darker kind of like more visual more we we loved horror films and uh, creating fantasy worlds so that's kind of what it came from and and then me and my cousin uh, uh, met this guitarist who was uh, uh, Quarton and we formed the, the band Bathory and he was uh, already way ahead of us in terms of uh, writing his own songs and and also technically he was like a real musician. We were still just banging away, having fun. Uh, so it, it was kind of created out of a mix of us liking the dark stuff, uh, like Black Sabbath, but also the punk scene was also big. So we wanted to play fast. And out of that came, you know, you said death metal, but it's actually black metal that we were playing. So that out of that came black metal. And I didn't really realize back then that that was the beginning of something that still exists today. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, I, I think the, the mix up I got with death metal is because I've just watched Lords of Chaos, of course. Oh. <laughs> but, the, oh, wow. but there was one quote in Lords of Chaos, which I think sort of could relate to you as a young person. And uh, it was about this moment that defined your existence. Uh, was there a moment in your life that has defined your existence from back then? Um, uh, I think uh, not. I wouldn't. I wouldn't point to one moment, but uh, but it was definitely you know for me uh, kind of like changing my career or whatever you want to call it. Back then, it was more like ideas, but for me to do uh, military service in Sweden. Uh, kind of became the moment where I realized that music is probably not what I'm going to do. Uh, filmmaking is, is came very natural to me. I accidentally ended up in, in, a, in a department in the, in the army where they were shooting film. And I discovered uh, editing machines. Back then it was like these tape to tape machines. And I would say that that's as close as I can get to like a moment where where I realized that this is uh, where I feel like home. And I, I felt uh, I didn't have to uh, practice or even learn it. It, just, it was just there. It felt very natural for me while drumming was always a struggle for me. I was always struggling to be good. I was good at coming up with logos and names and like, you know, the, the visual part of music, but I was never really a good drummer. So film editing was probably the, the one moment that kind of set the tone for what I'm still trying to do, which is conquer editing and, and be the best editor I can. What, um, how did you act upon that moment then? 
Well, again, I'm saying this again because it's it's such a big part of my life. This is pre everything because I'm I'm old. I'm a dinosaur, and so it wasn't really like you, I couldn't really think that. Oh, I want to do commercials or I want to do music videos. That was not on my radar because we didn't have it in Sweden. So it was became like short films, and it became that there was this rumor that mu- uh, that uh, commercial TV was going to come. So I ended up in a in a company where we who were ahead of their times with uh, commercial commercials. So we started to make commercials. And by the time we got commercial TV in Sweden, we were like the one that the, the, the ones that knew how to do it. And we were still very young. So, so commercial, this, yeah, that became like my life for, for, for years, actually. I mean, you said that the editing was, was the sort of the, the, the beginning. Did you have any actual um, education in making film? No, never. I never did. Uh, but I did. I was surrounded by people that was a couple of years older that I learned a lot from, uh, you know, especially. And, and I do see those first few years as practicing on commercials and real budgets and real jobs and real expectations from clients and stuff like that. That kind of uh, was my film school. Uh, but on the edit side, I did work for a director who was very ahead of, her, uh, ahead of his time in terms of telling stories in short time, you know, because in music videos and commercials, we we kind of, tr- we want to believe that we can tell the story of the history of the world in 30 seconds. And a good as a good editor, you actually can. You, there was one short film that you made, I don't know if it was the first one called The Hidden, um, Chaos in Your Mind or Chaos of yeah. Your Mind, I think it's yeah. called Chaos of the Mind. And yeah. um, it's really interesting because when I looked at that, today I could still see and I hate this word your brand but I could see certain trademarks of of Jonas Ockerlund in there you know I could see certain things already uh, yeah. flowering and and in there and it's um and a lot of it was you know was about this sort of dark image in your in in the head um yeah. uh, being presented on the screen in this in this short film um how important was it do you feel for you in the terms of those first few films that you made to actually start developing what has become really in essence a sort of trademark a brand yeah well i didn't know it back then and it took me years before i understood what my strength was as a as a director and editor because i always said to everybody i don't really have a style because i could do so many different things. And I felt like all the directors that I looked up to had such a distinctive style and a look or whatever it was, like a, a tone or something. But I never felt like I did until way later in my life where I realized that, you know, it is editing and sound design that is kind of like my style where you can recognize it's it, no matter what I do, it could be a commercial for Viagra or it could be a, a feature movie. It's like I still try as a director to always have like a little bit of my fingerprint on the stuff I do. And I think it's and, and especially on The Hidden, that short film you saw, it's uh, it's basically it's it's well shot, of course, but it's really editing and sound design that makes the impact of, of that film. And it's funny you mentioned that film. I'm very proud of it up to this day. That was the first thing I ever shot that kind of got a life outside Sweden. You know, it did like a little festival tour on festivals, and it actually ended up on a few in a few hands in Los Angeles. Like Oliver Stone saw it, and he called me, and like people actually called me after seeing that short film so yeah wait wait so a minute. Important you, sorry, you said oliver stone called you after oliver you made- stone saw it and i had a meeting with him and like uh it it's it's like it back then i guess it's still the same but back then it's like you know everybody's looking for like the new thing and that uh you know this is pre-internet <laughs> so it was like vhs tapes like circling around in hollywood with this short film that people talked about uh, so yeah, so so that was kind of like my first contact when I even think about working outside Sweden back then was not, you know, you could not think about it. What, what but, discussion did you have with him? Well, that, that was just one out of many meetings. It was like, you know, a lot of people like wanted to meet you. You know, everybody wants to pick up the flavor of the month, you know, and the Emperor's New Clothes is like big in Hollywood. 
So I don't know. It was like, you know, same questions, whatever, whatever meetings you do in Hollywood still up to the States. Like, so what do you want to do next? You know, <laughs> what are you up for now? And I'm like, my answer is always like, you know, whatever. Like, I'm like, good stuff. Everybody knows the good stuff. I mean, it's yeah. amazing to me because that feels that's a, a very early, early stage. And you have that sort of impact and people getting in touch with you, which sort of sets you up in a sense for failure because it's very quick and your career has taken a long time to build. I mean, you've had massive yeah. steps along the way, but you know, your career, you can see the, the building of your career over the years. And it's, it seems funny in a way that <laughs> this came out of the blue with the first ever yeah. Um, yeah. Um, short film, but then you've obviously, um, in Sweden started to make more films. And one person you worked with um, immediately, I think after that was Marie Fredriksson, who's yeah. uh, the late singer of, of Roxette. Um, and that was not with Roxette, was it? Was that with her solo at that point? Yeah, they were in the middle of, uh, I guess it was almost like the height of the career for Roxette. She did this solo album and uh, I had done a few music videos in Sweden uh, for local artists and Marie approached me like very ahead of her time. If you think about it, we basically made a visual album. We made basically made lemonade, lemonade <laughs> back then, you know, because she was like, here's my album. I want to have like visuals for the whole album. So it turned out to be like this 40 minute kind of like visual thing with her thoughts and her speaking and, you know, her music in there. And uh, that uh, caught the attention. It was it was for Swedish television, uh, but it caught the attention of her, which was her partner, and that's kind of what uh, brought me into work with uh, Roxette eventually. Now you worked in Sweden on a number of videos, the Cardigans with Roxette, as you mentioned. You obviously worked with Johan, as you've got a business with Johan, and he's uh, yeah. Johan Rink, and he's your best friend. But as you you directed the Stack of Bow um video as well so yeah. you've been uh connected in in that sense to to sweden how uh did it come about that you had a sort of breakout from sweden and i presume this was the the prodigy video that really caused the breakout yeah well it was a series of stuff that happened the, at the same time and i think you know, to be honest, I was kind of sick and tired of working with music videos in Sweden because there was no there was no real platform for it. And it, it took a lot of work to make these videos. Uh, so I was just about and this have happened a few times in my career when I'm just about to give up on music videos and then something happens. But it was uh, the, the, I, the, working with Roxette. I realized that all this hard work is actually spreading and people are actually seeing it. And uh, there was a series of stuff that happened at the same time. One of them was that Moby, uh, who kind of, he was, very, he was very smart. Early on, he was like, had his eyes on stuff that was going on outside America. So he did this uh, 007 theme for a James Bond song, song. And he actually called me and asked if I wanted to do the video. And that, what he saw from me, I'm not sure. But uh, at the same time, uh, Liam and Prodigy saw uh, a video I did with Per Gesslev, a solo album called Kicks, a, 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 a solo video that he saw. So he called at the same time. So I got these both calls at the same time doing uh, a, an English job and an American job. We shot it all here in Europe. And then from that came, uh, from the success of Smack My Bitch Up came uh, the first phone call from Madonna. Yeah, just to go back to um, Johan Rink, and I'll come through Liam Howlett and come up to Madonna, but um, <laughs> to, to Johan, because, you know, you've been very close over the years, you're very good friends, and probably, possibly your best friend, and also that you've worked so closely together. What have you contributed, do you think, to each other's professional lives? What have you been able to give Johan, and what has he given you in terms of your professional ability? Wow, that's a tough question. I mean, uh, I don't know. I think we always had like a pretty good give and take, you know, relationship between us. I was, you know, 
Well, not that it matters today, but back then, being a year older, it was always like making me a step ahead of him, you know, because when he was in school, I was already starting to work and like, you know, so we kind of like always kind of like helped each other and paved each other's way, you know, and I don't know, it's a, it's a tough question, but I feel like we always had like a pretty good on a friendship level, on a professional level, like always like a good give and take relationship. And weirdly enough now, because we don't live in the same city, we don't see each other much, but we're still like as connected as could be. And the minute we're in the same room, it feels like we're 14 again. So it's like, it's, it's like always, you know, that's kind of how our friendship is, you know, but if I have a problem, he's my first call, you know, it's like, if I have, if I'm sad or down or whatever, he's my first call. And, and I'm always his first call too. So, you know, so there's definitely a, a nice connection between us. I mean, Liam Howlett, when we talk about the prodigy smack my bitch up video, he said there was a real realness um, to the video. And that's why it had um, such an impact. Can you remember pitching it? Did you come up with the idea? What ideas did they have? Who contributed what? Yeah, I, I remember very clearly and I've told this story before, but uh, it's it's uh, they sent me the music and I could not uh, figure it out. I, I, I back then, the, like the tape sends out like there was not like today it's a little bit more focused, you know, but back then they just send tapes out and then you can write an idea and hopefully you get it. It's like winning the lottery. And I couldn't figure it out. So I actually turned it down. I passed on it because I was like, I didn't have a strong enough idea. And then I had a party night in Copenhagen with a friend. And I woke up in a hotel room with very vague memories. But one of the memories I had was seeing my own foot kicking in a door and uh, uh, somebody was sitting on the toilet in a bathroom stall. And I was in bed in Copenhagen with the worst hangover ever, thinking that this is kind of cool. Uh, and kind of wrote the shortest treatment I ever written. I think it was like half a page, basically like point of view, party night. Uh, and at the end, uh, there's a sex sequence where, uh, where we look in the mirror and we see it's a woman. That was basically it. It was no visual treatment, it was nothing else. It was just that. And we only had, we only had, I only met Liam like once or twice in my whole life. We met, nobody showed up at the shoot and I shot the video. And to be honest, they didn't like it. They pressured me to see an early, early cut. Uh, and I was like, I'm not done yet. Please just like bear with me. I need to finish the edit. Uh, eventually they, I sent them a tape and I, I got uh, here, up here in my bathroom, I have a fax framed from uh, some manager to Prodigy saying that we don't like the video. We, we're not going to pay to finish it. Stop working on it. We don't like it. So I was uh, crushed and I thought, OK, that was my 30 seconds of working out of, out of Sweden. Uh, so I finished the video without any uh, client around. So what I did was I started to edit in the music. I started to add sound effects. I started to attack. And then I sent off a tape to Liam because I knew his address because I had been to his house in Essex. I had his address. So I sent off a tape with a note saying that when you, whatever you have time, look at this. This is, this is how I intended the video to be. And it took, I don't know, it took a few weeks or so. And then <laughs> I got the phone call. And he looked at it and he was like, OK, we love it. We're going to use it. So I finished the video without any clients around. Just like I just did it. I remember that seeing that video and um, I can't remember if I was at MTV or in Germany at that point, but it was so impactful that everyone was just, um, you know, taken aback. It was unbelievable. And of course, that the, the twist, as it were, at the end that you realize at the end, oh, it's another woman was yeah. uh, you know a master stroke you said that was in the initial um description that was something that you always wanted in there you had that in your mind yeah. i'm gonna have this yeah, yeah yeah absolutely and it was that came from the from the title of the song smack my bitch up i mean that's that's where that's where it came from yeah i mean it was just it was uh, an um, an amazing amazing video and i can completely understand how that video had such an uh 
an, an impact and someone like Madonna would then contact you. How did she contact you? And what did she initially say? What's your initial contact? Well, I mean, somehow she got her hands on the video because as you know, as you remember, the video wasn't really released because it was heavily censored, but it had a lot of buzz around it. I remember I remember getting uh, press material from, uh, from my back then English agent because I got an agent right away when I started to work in England. And uh, there was like all these like debates on TV and like it was so much press around the video. It was almost for me, it was a shock because I didn't I I always thought the video as a comedy a comedy piece. Me and my friends were like laughing when we looked at it, but I had no idea that people would take it so seriously. Uh obviously in good for me, but somehow it ended up at her uh, hand in her in her hands. Uh, and uh, she just like, she said she wanted me to do Ray of Light. And, and basically it was a phone call. I didn't think it was her. I was like, I thought somebody was pulling my leg. I was like, <laughs> like doing that stupid thing. And then I realized it was her and I was like, shit my pants. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> I was like, and then she sent the music and I tried, I was trying, to, and then she actually flew me to New York. So I met her in New York the first time I met her in New York. And basically, I was basically doing what I always do with all my clients, trying to figure out what she wanted to do. And I misread her tremendously. I had such a bad ideas. I think I pitched like four or five ideas that was just too complicated and too big and wrong for her at the time and then eventually i pictured this like pretty simple idea uh, a day live fast forward quick as a ray of light like following the lyrics for following uh, uh, william orbit's uh, amazing beats and like all that stuff and and she bought it she was like and it was it was kind of a long shoot and i shot parts in sweden and everywhere the, her part was just like basically dancing around on that dance floor so uh, we only shot with her for like a day and the rest was like me basically uh, running around shooting time lapse as as we call it um i didn't know back then that the timing of that video was uh, the way it was i thought i was kind of embarrassed actually that the video was so simple i i i thought when i came back to sweden that it was uh, you know it's almost embarrassing like you go to america and you come back with this you know that uh, with my friends i was like this is all you got like i so i didn't realize then that you know madonna's time uh, where she was at the time you know and william orbit's amazing music and her uh, mario testino's album cover and like all that the package was amazing and it it must be one of the biggest comebacks ever because she, right before that album she was struggling well, it's interesting you say that because I interviewed Madonna in 92 and 94. And I think it was in the 92 interview, it may be in the 94, but she asked me who she should work with. And at that point, William Orbit had had his first album out and I'd heard it and I just said, William Orbit, because I just thought that would make a great combination. Now I'm not taking any credit because I think no. Madonna is a person that will ask everyone she meets. No, you know? no man, you're wrong, Steve. You and me are the reason for her big comeback. <laughs> Well, I love Madonna. So <laughs> the thing about Madonna as well is that she knows exactly what she wants. Um, you really have the feeling that that um, she she maybe she needs to hear the idea to know what she wants, but she knows what she wants, um, and um, she's much more cultured than I think people think she is, and I think she's much more interested in things than people think she is possibly yeah. that's today and not you know 20 years ago when when uh she really you know was on absolutely on top of the world but i think even today she's really interested in different things and hungry and and that's really fascinating about madonna so what does she bring to a meeting and what do you bring and how does that combination work because you've worked with her for such a long time now that there is something about the two of you that must work very well together. And I'm just wondering how you fit together. Well, I mean, it's uh, it's definitely a, 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 a two way respect uh, re working relationship uh, that eventually became friendship as well, you know, and uh, 
but uh, I don't know. It's like, you know, she is really good at getting the best out of you. She's really good at targeting talent. Uh, but, you know, she keeps me on my toes more than anybody else. And at the minute I think I know what she wants, I'm wrong. You know, the minute I, I think I like, ah, this is a home run, then I'm wrong. And I hate to say it, she's pretty much always right, <laughs> you know, so, but, but she gives you, weirdly enough, she gives you a lot of creative freedom, uh, but within those, within those rules that, you know, you have to be on your toes and you have to perform at your best, you know, you can't trick her into doing something half-assed or trick her into telling her that this is good when it's not good, you know, she knows her stuff, but she also, uh, work with people that this is not just me this is like everybody around her like uh, especially on her touring and also in the studio she always find people that are fantastic from the beginning but then they become a little better with her you know so and then you know she's good you know sometimes sometimes she doesn't know you know here's the song what do you think and the next time she comes and she says i have this vision this is what i want to do you know so sometimes i have to filter all the stuff because it's too many ideas and the next time it could be like, she doesn't know, you know, it depends on where they are. Usually in the beginning of an album uh, release, uh, you know, it's one thing. And when you're down to like the fourth and the fifth single, it's a little looser, you know? <laughs> so, but uh, you know, I love her to death and she's my art mother. She, I learned so much from her and uh, I, I don't know where I would have been with her. Not so much like the, uh, not, not only the work we did together, but also the attitude I bring with me when I work with other artists uh, from stuff I learned from her. That's really fascinating. Do you think that all superstars, because you've worked with Lady Gaga, obviously, you've worked with Beyonce, um, you've worked with U2, um, do you think that all superstars have that in common, that they understand when they know what they want and they understand when they don't know what they want um i think so i think so i mean because i mean obviously when you're in a group or when you're an artist you know that you are need people it's not a so you can't do it yourself you know and some all those all those names you just listed now are also known to have long relationships you know and that's something I valued from from the beginning that, you know, that we work together a few times and we get to know each other and we can do even better, you know, so and that I value that a lot, you know, and it, it's hard to meet people that you really like and connect with in this business, you know, so if you do, you should, you know, hold on to it. Um, so I, I do feel like that's something they have in common and. Um, you know, obviously all those names you just said are tremendous talents, you know, but I think they all know their limitations and they know when to, to, to say yes and when to say no, you know. Do they know when they're going to work with you that you are always going to bring, and I, I really don't know if you like this word because I keep using it, but I don't know what other word to use, your brand, your, you know, fast editing style, you're going to bring this into into their work so they already know that or is this part of a discussion that happens with everyone i think you, people you bring know what you want in as well don't you it's not just what they want you bring you you can see a Jonas Ockerlund video really i mean there's certain well, elements that you can identify well uh, thank you i take that as a compliment <laughs> but but yes and no i think i think there's i think that when an artist wants to work with me they know that i uh pull that i take them a little bit outside their comfort zone you know because if they want their average you know i'm not going to say any names but if they want their average performance video or average you know uh whatever is on top of the list it's i think they're I'm not their guy you know but if they want to do something that pushes uh, whatever direction it's it's pushed in. I think I'm their guy. And I think they know that. I think they've been around long enough and know my work well enough to know that that's when they call me. But I also know that some artists like to take me out of my comfort zone, you know, and, and that happened. <sighs> I have a moment in my career where, where I took, where I said yes to something that I, I wasn't expecting myself to say yes to that brought me into another 
uh, mindset, or if you may say, when in the beginning, when I started to work in America, I was very careful and I was very snobbish. I said no to, to stuff based on what I thought was good or what I thought was cool or, you know, it was the 90s. Like, and then I remember saying yes to Christina Aguilera's Beautiful, which was definitely out of my comfort zone. It was, it was something that I never thought I could do. She really wanted me. We had a great meeting. We connected with an idea. And that video brought me uh, creatively to a new level. It's like, and it's almost like from that point, I prefer to say yes to stuff that doesn't necessarily are my, you know, when I work with like Salvatore Metallica, it makes me nervous because I'm also a fan, <laughs> you know? So it's kind of loosen stuff up a little bit by working with other artists. And there's so much good music and so many great artists out there. So, you know. What do the formats of pop video and film have in common for you? Uh, well, not much on one hand, but, uh, but today, uh, I think the 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 and I'm I'm not I'm, I'm not a film I haven't gone to film school and I could never teach film but you know there's a, a specific way of how we tell stories and music videos that are now very common in movies you know the the type of editing with the wide shots and the quick cuts to the macros to the sound effects and all that that you now see in movies uh we started with in music videos so it's kind of like the the way of telling stories has translated into to movies uh while it's while sometimes we in music videos pick up you know i've done music videos with dialogue and like almost the shape of like you know if you take uh lady gaga telephone that could be 15 minutes out of a movie if you think about it like that could be 15 if they was just like another hour long it could be a movie you know <laughs> so there's like they're kind of like uh, as time goes uh, it kind of they like start to cross over more and more i mean in the early 80s when you first were watching or could watch music videos um because of uh maybe mtv america and you said you watched it in hotel rooms and so on and uh when mtv europe came to um sweden in uh, 87 i think it was then um, those first video directors were often film directors who then directed videos. Then there was a wave of video directors who then later became film directors. Right. Um, you've often talked about how uh, the power of MTV affected um, the creative input that you've been able to have in, in pop video, that it was a lot freer Mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, and the power mm -hmm. of MTV change. Can you explain that? Um, what you mean by that, and and also the impact on you of those first videos that were made by film directors? Mm -hmm. uh, of course. I mean, I mean the whole. Uh, uh, you know, I love those early early mo uh, early movie directors turning into music video directors. They're so ambitious and so great, and I think I appreciate them now more than ever actually i really enjoyed those but when people that i looked up to started to make music videos uh they were partly from movies but most of them actually came from fashion you know sean paul good was like you know one of the reasons i started and mondino uh you know and then some americans like joe putka you know and the english tony k you know like all those they were my, uh, the guys I looked up to. And eventually, you know, Fincher and Michael Bay and all those guys came around and they made it look so easy, just trans, transforming what they were good at into to movies. When I came to America, everybody was like, when are you going to do your first movie? And I had not in my wildest fantasy ever thought that I would do a movie. And being late bloomer, as I always been, I kind of rejected it for a few years. Then I made an, a small independent movie. I was offered big action movies, but I, may, I made uh, my first movie, Spawn, which was like more of a independent kind of like in the movie. And I, like I said, I am a late bloomer, not until now, 56 years old, do I feel comfortable writing, making movies. So I'm actually very happy. I didn't do it earlier as many directors uh, on my level did. Um, 
And on the MTV thing, it was like, I'm sure you know this, Steve, and, and you were part of it, but in the beginning, MTV was such a playful platform. And my brief was always do something different, do something that's never been done before, uh, do something that touched the audience, grabbed the audience, do something crazy. And we did, we did. I think everybody did in the beginning. And then I think mostly because I worked so much in America, Sweden was happening with the, with the local TV stations and, and music videos and England was happening too with great directors and all that. But eventually in America, it became, you remember the show TRL? which that I see that as the death of <laughs> the creative music videos, because what happened was that the, the, the record labels who didn't really know anything about marketing, they pretended they were no, they, they were like advertising agencies. They were starting to, the brief became like, whatever is on the top five on TRL, that's the kind of video we want. So it just became like, you know, they started to cut your to your songs. They started to like they faded down before the video was done. I even had a moment where they approved my treatments when the labels send the treatments to them to be asking if they were okay with it. And I got notes, you know. So to me, that was the death of it. And uh, and again, uh, that was another moment where I felt like I'm done with music videos. And then I got the call from Lady Gaga, and she was the first artist that I ever met who said, fuck MTV, we don't need them. We can go YouTube, we can go social, we, we don't need them. So out of that came, you know, so much creativity and the format became long and we did like all this like best stuff out of that. And I think if it wasn't for her, uh, I think I would have given up on music videos right around that time. I mean, there's bit to unpack there, I think, but the, the <laughs> spun, which I love, I mean, the editing is spun and the, the visual image of spun is, is, is an incredible um, start to, to your movie career. What's I found out today, because I was just looking up and I thought, oh, I must do a bit of research, more research into your wife. <laughs> oh. And she's done it. She it was interviewed on a podcast called MILF um, and <laughs> B Ockerland. <laughs> And yeah. uh, she met you on Spun because you were looking for a stylist. And she says that she turned up with her portfolio and you didn't take a look at it. And you went, you've got the job. <laughs> <laughs> was well, it love at first sight? <laughs> uh, yeah, it kind of. It, it was actually, at least from my end. But uh, that's not why she gave, that's not why I gave her the job. I just felt very confident with her. But she was she the, the, the part of this story was that Mickey Rourke was in Spawn and Mickey was uh, like saying yes to do the movie, but he wanted his costume designer. And that turned out to be B. Uh, I, I had the worst fantasy of Mickey's costume designer showing up being some, you know, monster and in walks B. Uh, B started to work very young. So she had all this experience but she was uh, much younger than me, but she had already done like three movies with Mickey and she had done movies and her portfolio was just filled with like, you know, Rolling Stone covers and Manson was happening and she knew Manson. It's like, I was like blown away by somebody being so experienced and so good. And, and Spawn was like, Spawn was spontaneous. It was, it was literally like all these big offers came in on big action movies and I, I was basically, I had much more attitude back then than, than, uh, than I do now. So I was basically, fuck you guys. I'm not going to do your big movies. I'm going to do this little movie <laughs> with my friends. And the casting came easy. I was like just listing the, the favorite actors at the time. And they all said, yes, I didn't realize that it's much harder <laughs> in real life than it was back then. So, uh, and I connected to the script. The script was good. You know, it's written by this guy who was basically homeless and, it was based on his life story and, you know, so that's how I met B. And, and from that point, we've been, uh, you know, working on and off up till today. I mean, it does feel like you have a, a very strong working partnership, as well as a partnership, obviously, but you have a very strong working partnership um, throughout your career because there's, there, it's always crossing, you know, you always seem to be 
working together, then maybe separately, then together again, and so on and so forth. Yeah. What do you think, and I don't mean this on a personal level, I mean on a professional level, what do you think she has contributed to your understanding of style? Well, it started already on Spun, and I, I feel like she's, up to this day, I feel like she's a rare, a very rare type of costume designer, because to me, she, she brought uh, a very strong fashion sense. She knew what looks cool, what's, what's, what is cool, but, she, but even uh, more than that, she brought so much character to, to her designs. You know, for, for where I came from, it was like you either use fashion people or you work with movie people or theater people or, but she's kind of like combining all those things. And she made my character stronger than I could. She helped me, uh, you know, with, with these details in the wardrobe to make the character stronger. And I think that's, that's her strength up to this day. She loves, she loves fashion and she loves design, but she understands character more than any costume designer I ever met. Okay, now to the story, because you mentioned about the, the, the importance of the story when you read it. What do you look for um, in a story and how do you attach yourself to a story? Uh, you're talking about movies and-, and Yeah, I'm talking about story. movies, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, to be honest, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, drawn to, I'm drawn to real life stories. Uh, I'm drawn to dark comedy, I would say. Uh, I, I kind of, it's easier for me to know what I don't want to do than to answer what I want to do. Uh, but I kind of always, you know, and it's, it's very clear now with this series I just did that where I got a chance to kind of like put everything I like into one, one series, you know, like strong characters, a serious undertone, but a lot of dark humor. Um, so that's kind of what I always look for. But you'll be surprised, Steve, that finding stories is not the hard thing for me. I actually have a long list of, of dream projects. The hardest thing as a filmmaker is to get stuff done. And, and, uh, and it's almost like, actually, Johan Rank told me the other day, he said, it's not important what you do anymore. It's important who you do it with. You know, it's really, really hard to find good partners and and uh, to get stuff done in the right, right way. You know, and especially on the independent level, where I where I where I feel comfortable, it's hard to get stuff done. You know, like Lords of Chaos took me 15, 20 years to get going. You know, it's uh, but uh, you know, I guess that's uh, that's that's also in the, a little bit in the nature of the jobs and the stories I'm drawn to. Just to, now to go on to Lady Gaga because of paparazzi, you mentioned that uh, that video, and that video has everything in it. I mean, <laughs> it has female <laughs> empowerment in a sense because there's this um, woman who's killed by Alexander Skarsgård, <laughs> or pushed, <laughs> not killed, pushed, and then she's uh, crippled and in, in a wheelchair. But then she has her moment uh, at, at at the end of the the video, and it has this. There's lots of other elements in there. There's this Hitchcockian fall where she falls yeah. down and it has this spiral yeah, yeah, yeah. going, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> vertigo type idea. And yeah. there's there's loads of things in there. And there's one thing in it that really interested me that, um, and I've always remembered this at the beginning when Lady Gaga speaks a little bit of Swedish to Alexander Skarsgård yeah. <laughs> and they communicate in Swedish. Now the Swedes that I've known in my life are very much a community when they're somewhere else in the world. They so, do sort of hang together. Um, yeah. and, and that's been an important thing to you. Now, I know your wife went to Sweden when she was something like, uh, sorry, she went to America when she was about 14, but yeah. she's originally Swedish. The yeah. people that you've know that you worked with, that you've had around you, you made Alexander Skarsgård's career grow <laughs> because of that video. I mean, he, you know, he's become what, one of the great actors, but it started in that, um, in that video. How important is the community of Swedes uh, to a Swedish person outside Sweden? Well, I mean, for, for starters, when I started to work in America, there wasn't, it was basically me, uh, Peter Stormer, and, and, and maybe Stellan Skarsgård was around there, but, and Lasse Hallstone, it wasn't uh, like now there's like hundreds of Swedish people working there. But uh, I kind of always felt like I was a little bit outside that 
you know, because I know that suites kind of like hang together in LA and they be are creative together, but I was kind of like, I never felt like I was in part of that group, but I do have my long relationship. Like my DP that I work with, we worked together for 35 years, you know, and I do have, you know, my crew are not as many Swedes now as they used to be, but they're still very long relationships. And I have a home in Sweden. I always go back to Sweden and we look out for each other, you know, and the Alexander thing was, I'm sure he would have done perfectly well without me but you know it was it was uh, the timing of him saying yes to that video was just great you know um uh, and i knew because yeah, i knew him and i know he was perfect for it he looked apart and he was perfect the swedish dialogue though was improvised on the day that was never pl- part of the plan they were going to have that dialogue and then he started to teach her some swedish and i said let's shoot it in swedish and we did and subtitled it and she she did a pretty good job it sounds it sounds very good. <laughs> well, I don't think there's anything Lady Gaga can't do, is there? Really? Why? True. What makes her so um, special? I mean, she is the phenomena of our age, um, yeah. and proving herself in so many different areas now. What What do you think it is about Lady Gaga that makes her absolutely special and different and unique? I I don't know. I, it has to be, you know. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to have met a few people in my life that has that ultimate integrity and ultimate creative creativity uh, that just comes from within. You know, I think that she's part of that small group of artists that I met that doesn't really look over your shoulder, doesn't really bother you what other things are, what other people do. And when it just comes from within, it just pours out of her hands. You know, obviously, musically, she's a genius. She can sing and she can play instruments and all that stuff but just like all oh, her head is just amazing it's like you know you can have diet you know all the videos we've done she's talking and i'm trying to filter everything she's saying you know it's like because it's just boiling over with creativity you know which is pretty cool how do you think someone stays like that um at that level and in essence it's the same question to you because in order to stay creatively at, at the top of your game, you have to also have a lot of input, I presume, into your yeah. life to be able to have, you know, to keep that level. Is that what Lady Gaga does? Has she got an incredible amount of input? Have you got an incredible amount of input? Are you constantly, you know, reading, watching things, being aware of what's going on? Uh, I, I couldn't speak for her, but I, know, I do know that we live lives where we, are fortunate enough to travel a lot to meet a lot of people and do see a lot you know so there's always there there's a natural intake i don't have to search for it it just happens uh but i do know for myself that i've gone through periods where i pick up inspiration from different things you know i take a lot of pride in that i've never kind of like ripped people off or stole any ideas uh, but I do know that I've gone through, especially the first few years of my career, I was very influenced by the fashion world. I, I, I knew it. And I, 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 I was, I loved everything fashion and then advertising became a big thing and music, obviously. And I like all those things. And I remember, I don't know exactly when, but it was sometimes, uh, sometime back, I just started to go back more to myself, you know, and, and, pick more inspiration from my own life and from my own experiences, which is kind of like a bold thing to do. I didn't realize when it happened, but, but it did happen. And now I feel like everything I do comes from it within because I'm not, I'm not as uh, aware of what's going on, on in the world. And I, I used to see everything. And now I'm kind of like a little bit more in my bubble. Uh, and that's, that's good for my writing, you know, and when I write my movies, I feel like it's good for me to kind of like be in this bubble, but it's hard when I'm, should be, uh, when I'm trying to write music videos because I have no idea what people are doing. I haven't done music videos now in a while, but I'm trying, I'm, I was planning to get back into it, but I don't know really how at this point. I think one thing that's interesting is that you said before about um, that power of MTV in terms of, sort of stopping the creativity, particularly your creativity, 
uh, in that era. And then along comes YouTube and it ends. But now you work in film and film is a collaborative medium. It's a medium that's very expensive, high risk. And yeah. it also has levels of decision making. So how does creative freedom look in the film world in comparison to the video yeah. world? Well, I mean, it's it's no secret that there is no creative freedom in, in filmmaking. It's just too many people involved and too much at risk. And there's always a boss. You know, there's always, you know, uh, very, very few directors have a, a, what we call final cut, you know. But it, again, it's it, I come back to what I said before. It's it's it. You have to be on the same page, and you have to work with the right people, you know. Because, and half my job, more than half of my job, is to figure out what the people that pay me to do my job, what they what what they want and what they understand, so they understand what I do. So we're on the same page, you know. I've done jobs where we're not on the same page, and it's a disaster, you know. So it's all about communicating and just trying to you know, find partners that are on the same page as you. If you if you do that, then you could then you could have a lot of creative freedom. But it is I always have somebody to report back to. Always. I I mean, maybe I didn't when I did a hidden, you know, but uh, I've done over a thousand jobs and I there's always somebody that I need to get an approval from uh, on my stuff. And that's just in the nature of filmmaking. <laughs> it's really the worst. It's really the worst creative job you can have, actually, you know, because you don't really own anything. Uh, you, there's always somebody else owning it and you're always kind of looked over by somebody. But if you're lucky enough to work with artists that I worked with and financiers that trust you, then you can make match. Then it could be magical. I want to ask you something from a writer's perspective, because you've mentioned it as well, that um, as a writer, you're dealing with your own issues always. You know, there are themes in your own life which you are dealing with and, and regurgitating in a sense, and you are finding more about yourself, but you are also overcoming some of the trauma in your own life. Has, has that been the process for you recently? Because you said um, that that has been part of it, actually being in this bubble and looking at, at your own life. Have you able, and I, I say trauma loosely because we all have, certain right. traumas in our life that we're that, that we're dealing with um and have you been able to sort of deal with things in your life through your creativity um i'm talking about the writing yes i think so i mean the, nothing has been <laughs> when i deal with my traumas or whatever you want to call them uh that's never been uh going into production <laughs> that's in my drawer <laughs> but but i do but the, the series i just did for netflix which is basically sweden from the 40s up till the 80s uh i took advantage of my own experiences a lot like like every day uh and i was writing six hours of of, of uh drama so it's like a lot of writing but every day uh, and every scene basically have something from my own experiences, something from my own life. The dialogue is very much how I spoke with my friends back in the 70s and the 80s. There was like, uh, for the first time, I wrote in Swedish, which I have never done before, which scared me in the beginning. But then I realized I had this huge source of, of knowledge that I could never have in America. I can have a, a, an outsider's perspective in America, which is very useful but here in Sweden I had like all the insights and the references for details that I can never have in America so yes and no I mean but I don't know I sometimes close friends to me have asked me if, if, how I feel when I release something dark or uh, you know you must be very happy now when something is very happy but I don't feel like it, my work is a reflects where I am at the moment in my life. I really don't feel like that. You know, my, my, my ideas are always based on analyzing uh, my clients, sort of say, like, you know, what is this? What is it for? What did you do before? And when is it coming out? How are people gonna see it? It's always, and I think that's my commercial background that, you know, forces me to create a reason for what I do. But movies is different, you know, and I love writing. 
I started late because I'm dyslexic and I always had, I never thought I could write. Uh, I realize now that I, I can, and I, I have a lot, I have confidence now. Lords of Chaos was a, a stepping stone for me because I looked for writers and then I was like, I'm just gonna do it myself. And it just poured out of my hands. It was like incredible uh, because I had been carrying the story with me so long. Um, so that gave me confidence to, to write. Yeah, I, obviously I know my limitations. I'm not, you know, I couldn't write anything, but at least now I have confidence to do it and I, and I love it. Writing is really my main focus right now, actually. Well, Jonas, I want to thank you because you've created so many wonderful things over the years that have contributed to the culture. Um, some of them generational moments. I think Prodigy's um, Smack My Bitch Up was a, was a generational moment. You know, like when rap music came, then it was like anybody over a certain age was an interest and everybody under was. And this sort of generational moment of, of image where it was like every, everyone of a, of a certain age or a certain type of thinking loved it. And yeah. then everyone else didn't like it. And I think you've continued to do that in your career. And Lords of Chaos that I saw today is uh, a stunning um, wow. film. And I, I really, really loved it. And I think it, it was great. So I look forward to everything you contribute in the future. <laughs> and um, yeah, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And as I said in the beginning, you're just a warm and very kind, open, community person. And, uh, and for me, that's probably the most important thing. So thank you, Jonas Ockelen. Thanks for your kind words. Thank you, Steve. Up there is an interview I recommend. Down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews. And here is where you can connect. <laughs>